Hello, everyone. So I will, okay, this is 5 p.m. exactly, Paris time. So uh, I really want to, to say, well, um, to, to thank every one of you. Uh, all Septodon team is very pleased to welcome you today for this webinar presented by Professor Stanley Malamed. Um, we will have a 45-minute presentation that will be followed by more or less 15 minutes for all your questions. So as you can see, uh, the mics are in mute for everyone but uh, Professor Malamed and myself. So please use the chat on the right side of your screen uh, if you have any questions and, um, and uh, Stanley will answer them at the, at the end of the presentation. Just for your information as well, this webinar will actually be recorded and we will send you within 24 hours the link to the video. Again, uh, thank you all for attending and of course, thank you especially to Professor Malamed for what will be, I'm sure, a very interesting presentation. Floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or actually, good morning, California. Good afternoon, good evening, good late evening, and early morning. Apparently, we have people from all over the world, so I want to thank you. Um, I am Stanley Malamed, and I am a dentist anesthesiologist, which is now a specialty in dentistry in the United States. And I was a professor at the University of Southern California School of Dentistry in Los Angeles uh, for 40 years. I retired from full-time teaching back in 2013. And this is why we're here. Um, good old COVID-19, the coronavirus, which has uh, made the world very, very different. So in starting, let me just say, I hope that all of you who are listening are healthy, will remain healthy during this interesting time. And I really hope that we'll have an opportunity to do this in person sometime in the not too distant future. So um, this is a disclosure slide. I am a consultant to Septadon, who is uh, sponsoring, of course, this, this webinar. Uh, that's just for your information. So my email address, and uh, you are going to be sent automatically a copy of the slides, all the slides I'm showing you here today. But And you'll have a chance to ask me questions at the end of this seminar. But um, if you have any other questions for me, or if you want any additional information specifically about one subject I'm talking about, there's my email address, malamid at usc.edu. Feel free to contact me and um, we can talk on the internet. These are my three textbooks, my book on sedation, my book on medical emergency, and today, of course, we're discussing the book in the middle, which is the new edition of my handbook on local anesthesia. And I and the entire Malamud family hope that you have all three of these books uh, because we need the money, very, very simply. So let's get going here. Uh, local anesthetics are the safest and the most effective drugs in all of medicine for the prevention and management of pain. Now, you also notice that there's an asterisk after the word safest, which says on the bottom when used properly. Now, Normally, I, I would give a seminar on local anesthesia lasting anywhere from three to six hours. So what we're getting here today in 45 minutes is going to be a short version, and I won't have the opportunity to go off on the tangent that I normally do. But here are the five local anesthetics that are available in the dental profession worldwide. Articane, alphabetically, Articane, Bupivacaine, Lidocaine, Mepivacaine, and Prilocaine. Now, a couple of things we have to sort of know as, as we get started here. Not everybody out there in the audience has the availability of all five of these drugs. The, the availability of local anesthetics does vary from country to country. And when I talk about sedation, it, it, which is an integral part of our discussion here today, the same is true. The legalities on using different forms of sedation, uh, oral sedation, intravenous sedation, nitrous oxide inhalation sedation, will vary from country to country. So please, you must keep this in mind as I go through my discussion here today. So let's then get back to local anesthetics. And um, very simply, they are the most important drugs we have in our profession. If tomorrow were a drug-free day 
in dentistry, even though most of us are not practicing dentistry at this point in time, but let's say the world were back to normal. Uh, if, if tomorrow were a drug-free day in dentistry, there really would not be an awful lot of things that you could do other than catch up on paperwork, perhaps. But if you take a look at this, uh, I went to the, the major manufacturers of local anesthetics for dentistry in the world. And in fact, these companies probably sell about 95% of all the local anesthetics that are used in our profession. And I found from, I got from them how many cartridges of local anesthetic of each of these drugs are being manufactured worldwide. If you look at these numbers, lidocaine, 1 billion cartridges a year. Articaine, 600 million. Mepivacaine, 300 million, and smaller numbers for prilocaine and for bupivacaine. And then you also have to keep in mind that there are countries, for example, India and China, where a lot of local anesthetic is used in multi-dose vials as opposed to dental cartridges. We use an awful lot of local anesthetics. In fact, the dental profession is the major user of local anesthetics. So this slide I have right here, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, is showing you the formulations of the different drugs that are available in North America. Uh, articaine with epinephrine, upivacaine, uh, which is the long-acting local anesthetic, lidocaine with epinephrine, mepivacaine plain and with epinephrine, and prilocaine uh, plain and with epinephrine. Again, different countries, different formulations, but these are the primary drugs that we use in, in our profession. So getting down to the meat of what I want to do here today is talk about pain management for the special needs patient. Now, let me sort of define what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the use of local anesthetics, primarily pain control, uh, in patients who have cardiovascular risks, the geriatric patient, pediatrics, patients who are pregnant, patients who are nursing, and then go off and finish up with one last subject, which is a very important one, is how on earth are you going to get that infected mandibular molar, the hot mandibular molar, uh, anesthetized? You can go in and open up that tooth and clean out the pulp. So starting out, the more medically compromised a patient is when he or she comes in your office, the greater the likelihood of things going wrong medical emergencies, for example. But you know, the, the concern is, and, and I'm really going to be talking about medical emergencies here today, but local anesthetics, local anesthetics, the use of epinephrine, use of sedative drugs in certain of these patients. So I want to quickly go over this. Now, this is something that, that it's been around in medicine since the late 1940s, but we introduced this uh, into dentistry in the mid-1970s. ASA stands for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And they have what is called a physical status classification system, uh, reviewing the patient's medical history, doing sorts of uh, x-rays, uh, chest x-rays, blood tests before surgery. How much of a risk is this patient who's not going to undergo surgery of dying during the surgery? Okay, that's the medical version. So what we're doing here, we, we modify this for dentistry. And when you review the medical history, you do the vital signs in the patient, an ASA-1 is a normal, healthy patient, an ASA-2 and 3 are patients with milder and more severe forms of disease. And then we get down to ASA-4, and that is a pay, that's the red flag. This is the patient after your evaluation of the patient, you're saying to yourself, uh-uh, the medical risk of this patient of having a medical problem, there's no guarantee it's gonna happen, but the risk is too great. But for an ASA-1, ASA-2, and ASA-3, elective dental care is indicated. Now, here's a little, a little version of it, if you will. Uh, and it deals with the ability to walk up that one flight of stairs. So the ASA-1 patient walks up the flight of stairs and just keeps going. ASA-2 walks up the flight of stairs, but on top of the flight of stairs, has to stop for a moment or two to catch his breath or because of undue fatigue or chest pain. The ASA-3, the gentleman sitting on the, on the flight of stairs about halfway up, he has to, he'll make it up the flight of stairs, okay? But he has to stop at least one time en route, again, because of chest pain, undue fatigue, or shortness of breath. The ASA-1, 2, and 3 patients are treatable for elective dental care. But on the right, on the left-hand side of the screen, we see the ASA-4. The ASA-4 is the patient who, again, whatever their medical condition may be, or conditions, multiple conditions, they 
should not be in that dental chair to receive elective dental care. Now, if that patient does need dental care, the best, best place for them to do this, of course, is gonna be in a hospital environment, a dental clinic located within a hospital or by a dentist who is well-trained in handling or treating these medically compromised patients. So let's then start with a very common situation. Uh, the most common cause of death in the entire world is cardiovascular disease. And I'm gonna talk about, not talk about, but how you manage a patient who has a history of angina, a patient who had had a myocardial infarction to use the late term, a heart attack. So it's status post myocardial infarction and very, very commonly elevated blood pressure, hypertension. And very, very simply, anything that makes that patient's heart work harder is going to increase the risk of a significant, uh, of a patient with angina having an anginal attack, of a stroke occurring. So any, we, we wanna be careful about that. In any patient, of course, but especially in patients who have a history of cardiovascular problems. And from the dental perspective, these are the two things that do it inadequate pain control, and ignoring a patient's fear. The release of endogenous catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, in any patient will elevate their heart rate and blood pressure, but in these patients who have cardi underlying cardiovascular problems, more specifically, this can become dangerous. So let's just then talk about local anesthetics and epinephrine and sedation in these patients. There are no contraindications to the administration of local anesthesia in a cardiovascular risk, risk patient who is an ASA-3. Again, if you were to be treating in a hospital environment an ASA-4, the patient who should not receive elective care but has pain or infection, local anesthetics are not contraindicated in these patients. When it comes to epinephrine, and if you think about it with an infected tooth, it would be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve effective pain control on an infected mandibular molar, for example, with a plain local anesthetic, 3% mepivacaine or 4% prilocaine without a basic constrictor are not gonna produce the depth of anesthesia that we need. So if you're going to be using local anesthetics on this higher risk cardiovascular patient, you wanna use the lowest concentration available of epinephrine. Now in most countries, that's epinephrine one in 200,000, there are other countries that have other concentrations, even one in 400,000 in some countries. But you wanna use the, the, the lowest available concentration and you wanna use the smallest volume of local anesthetic with epinephrine that's appropriate for effective pain control. When it comes to sedation, again, uh, a fearful patient, endogenous catecholamine release, and the heart rate's gonna go up, the blood pressure is gonna go up, you're increasing the cardiac workload, and that is not good. Sedation is indicated, and I'm, you're going to hear me say this an awful lot uh, in the next 35 minutes, that inhalation sedation, nitrous oxide oxygen, is the preferred technique. And in this patient specifically, well, for, in all patients, number one, nitrous oxide relaxes the patient, takes away their fear. Number two, it elevates the pain threshold. But in this patient specifically, the one with cardiovascular risk, it provides the heart muscle, the myocardium, with extra oxygen and that's gonna minimize the risk of any adverse events occurring. Okay, so let's then move on to the next category, which is the geriatric patient. And I just wanna show you a little shout out, as, as we say, to my mother-in-law, uh, this is Evelyn, and recently passed away, but she was 102 years old when she passed away and was mentally fantastic until, you know, till close to the end. So geriatric patients, are li we are living longer. And, uh, <laughs> I just want to show you this because this is the official categorization of geriatric patients. Uh, I happen to fit into, unfortunately, I moved into the middle category not too long ago, but we have the young old, the old, and the old old. All right, so let, this is called the normal distribution curve, and you also may know this as the bell-shaped curve. And what this basically is saying to you that, let's talk about a drug, for example. If I were to say to you that lidocaine with epinephrine provides about one hour's worth of pulpal anesthesia, that would mean that if I gave this drug to 100 or even 1,000 people, 70% of them would have that desired effect. They would have pulpal anesthesia for one hour, 70% of the bell-shaped curve. 15% of those patients would have less than an hour, 45 minutes, 30 minutes, but 
15% would have more than an hour. And this is the bell-shaped curve. Now, why is that important? Because patients at either end of the age spectrum, and again, this is, you know, it's, it's not absolute, but patients who are under the age of six years of age and those who are over 65, the percentage of hyper-responding persons increases, as you can see here. So when you're treating a geriatric population, the average dose of many of the drugs that we're using is too much for them. We have to learn how to give less, smaller dose, if you will, to those patients. Now, again, when it comes to local anesthetics, there's no problem whatsoever. Um, I'm, I'm saying it here, and I'll try to explain this to you a little bit later on, that articaine is the preferred local anesthetic. But regardless of what local anesthetic you're using, the dose should be, the volume, the dose should be kept as low as possible, and block injections are preferred to infiltration. If you're treating more than two teeth or three teeth in that patient, a nerve block, such as the uh, inferior alveolar, the gout gates and the mandible, the uh, ASA, MSA and PSA injections in the maxillary arch are preferable because you're putting in one injection is going to give you anesthesia of three, four, or five teeth. And you're going to be using less local anesthetic and getting more for your money. Epinephrine is required, not all the time, but it is required. And again, the, the lowest effective concentration, which is going to be a one at 200,000 for most of us, keeping the volume as small as possible. Sedation, absolutely, uh, to minimize the release of endogenous catecholamines. And once again, inhalation sedation with nitrous oxide octane is preferable. Now here's, I, I gave you the first three reasons. Number one is, you know, it relaxes the patient, takes away their fear. It also elevates the pain threshold and it provides extra oxygen. But many of these geriatric patients have what are called comorbidities. They may have liver disease, hepatic dysfunction, renal disease. Nitrous oxide is effective in these patients where oral medications, uh, which are metabolized by the liver, excreted in, the, in, in urine through the kidneys, may not be indicated. But when you are using an oral sedative medication in an older patient, start your dose on the low side of average. So let's say a drug like diazepam, which used to be called Valium, came orally as two, five, and 10 milligrams, where the average dose would be five milligrams. If you're treating a geriatric patient, an older patient, you start out with the smaller dose, the lower dose, the two milligrams in that situation. Pediatrics is, is very similar to geriatrics. Again, this is the other end of that age spectrum. This is the under six patient. And the same thing is true here, where there is a higher incidence of hyper-responsiveness to medications. Now, that's not really the problem when it comes to local anesthetics. The problem with local anesthetics is many people give too much. Now, I'm trying to be very kind here. Uh, what I'm looking at right now, it says here that most significant adverse reactions to local anesthetics occur in patients who weigh less than 30 kilograms, 66 pounds. These problems don't happen in the offices of pediatric dentists. They happen in the offices of general dentists. And the reason has to do with the fact that we forget, the general dentist forgets that he or she is treating a kid who weighs 22 kilos, which is about 50 pounds, you know, and administers local anesthetic the same way they would to a person who's an adult who weighs 70 kilos or 80 kilos. So here's what we basically, not basically, here's what we do teach to our pediatric residents, to our dental students. If you are treating a child who weighs less than 30 kilos, okay, 66 pounds, and if you're treating one quadrant, one quadrant only, a plain local anesthetic is okay. 3% uh, lipivacaine, 4% prilocaine, and where it's still available, lidocaine plain. These all, all three of these drugs do not have a vasoconstrictor in them. However, and this really gets to be the important part, if you are treating this young child and you're doing more than one quadrant in a dental visit, always, always use a local anesthetic, which contains a vasoconstrictor, okay? Articaine with epinephrine is preferred. And I'm gonna come back to this later on, but here's the major reason why. Overdose of local 
also called a toxic reaction, is the biggest problem when it comes to pediatric patients. It's giving too much. The longer the drug stays in the cardiovascular system, once the drug leaves the nerve, it enters into the cardiovascular system, and it has effects on other, other organs. The, the brain is depressed by local anesthetics. The heart muscle is depressed by local anesthetics. And if the blood level gets too high, an overdose occurs. Okay, the longer the, again, the, the, the longer the drug stays in the patient's bloodstream, the higher the concentration is gonna be, the greater the risk of an overdose. What's called the elimination half-life. It's the amount of time it takes for the blood level of a drug to decrease by 50%. The elimination half-life of lidocaine, mepivacaine, and prilocaine is 90 minutes. These drugs are metabolized primarily in the patient's liver, and they hang around in the blood for a long time. Articaine is metabolized, 95% of articaine is metabolized almost instantaneously once it leaves the nerve and enters into the capillaries and veins into the cardiovascular system. It has an elimination half-life of only 27 minutes. It is gotten rid of faster than the other local anesthetics. Another thing to consider with children is that they require less. They don't need 1.8 milliliters or 2.2 milliliters of local anesthetic to achieve good pain control. A fraction of a cartridge is all you need, seriously. You know, if you see a, an empty cartridge on the tray of a, of a pediatric dentist, uh, they've probably given two, three, four, five injections with that. You children, remember, keep in mind that the nerves, the, the bone is thinner in children, so infiltration in the mandible works. The nerves are thinner in children. It doesn't require as much local to block that nerve. Children require smaller volumes of local anesthetics. <clears throat> The other thing, and this is especially true for anybody out there who treats children who is not a pediatric dentist, it is very important to know how much. Now, you know, how much uh, the maximum recommended dose, okay? But keep in mind also that there's a bell-shaped curve for that. But you need to know this and then how to convert that maximum dose into how many cartridges of local anesthetic you can use. So here's a chart. And again, you'll be receiving a copy of all these slides. now. These are the numbers, the MRDs, the maximum recommended dose for, uh, approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. One thing you need to keep in mind is that many countries, their health organizations, the numbers, even though they may be similar, in some cases are different. So depending upon where you are right now, where you practice dentistry, you need to know these numbers. Okay, but keep in mind, let's go look at lidocaine, for example, where in the United States, it says that it's seven milligrams per kilo, not giving more than a 500 milligram absolute maximum dose. Okay, this again would be the middle of the bell-shaped curve. So there are going to be patients who will have an adverse response, an overdose, if you will, to a lower dose of, epi of lidocaine, less than 500 milligrams. But also keep in mind that these are maximums. You never wanna go there. Okay, you wanna keep your dosages as low as possible. You don't wanna approach these numbers if it is possible. Epinephrine, not pro no problem at all. But again, uh, the, the major problem here, again, we're adding epinephrine to a local anesthetic to make the drug, the, the depth of anesthesia greater and also to prolong the duration of anesthesia. And that's great, except that children have a problem, it happens with adults also, but if your lip is numb, you know, they might bite on it. They might chew on it. And when the anesthesia wears off later on, it's going to be painful, as you can see from these two photographs. This is a study that was published back in the year 2000 in the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry. And very simply, these are children who received inferior alveolar nerve blocks. And you can see that if they were under the age of four, 18% um, of them went home and they chewed their lip, they chewed their tongue. So this is a problem you have to be aware of whenever you're treating, even without local, without epinephrine. Uh, in that case, the duration of soft tissue anesthesia will not be as long, but uh, with epinephrine, you're talking three to five hours of soft tissue anesthesia and the risk is there. So there is a drug out there and it's called fentolamine mesylate, has a brand name of Oriverse, and it is a local anesthesia reversal agent. Now, unfortunately, it is not available in all countries at this point in time. It's available in the United States and Germany. 
But let me just show you this study that we did. Uh, this is going back now to the early 2000s. Patients had a uh, procedure, I'm just showing you the, the lower lip, but patients had a dental procedure done with local anesthesia. At the end of the procedure, they got an injection of, you have to inject this drug into the place where you put the local anesthetic earlier. It's a vasodilator. So it helps to speed up the absorption of the anesthetic out of the nerve into the cardiovascular system. And um, patients either got fentolamine at the end of the procedure or they got a what's called a sham injection. They were the controls, they did not get it. At one hour after the administration of fentolamine, 41% of these patients, their lower lip was completely back to normal versus only 7.4. At an hour and a half, at 90 minutes, 70% of these patients had complete loss of anesthesia versus 13%. So it works, it works very nicely. And again, it would minimize in adults or children, minimize the risk of self, we call it self-inflicted soft tissue injury. Something else I wanna mention, and again, depending upon where you're listening to this, uh, this computer controlled local anesthetic delivery is either very popular or maybe you haven't even heard of it. But this is the ability to administer all local anesthetics essentially painlessly. I'm not gonna ever say guaranteed that you're gonna be able to give a palatal injection totally painlessly. But using a device, the original one was called the wand introduced back in the late 1990s. And um, a newer version of it, a handheld version is called the Dentapen. But these uh, deliver the local anesthetic at a certain rate based by a computerized program. And again, even in the palate, these do allow you to administer local anesthetics much more comfortably than with the average injection. Sedation, here we go again, inhalation sedation with nitrous oxide oxygen is preferred. Now in the pediatric patient, uh, well, it, 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 it relaxes them. It provides a degree of soft tissue analgesia and it elevates the pain threshold. Oral sedation in patients up to 30 kilos, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a higher, you know, you have more hyper-responding patients. So the usual initial dose of a pediatric oral sedative is about 50%, about half of the adult dose of that medication. And benzodiazepines, drugs like uh, diazepam, midazolam, uh, triazolam are very popular medications. Again, I'm only using generic names because brand names vary dramatically from country to country. All right, so let's then talk about the, pe the pregnant patient. And uh, a basic rule, and this is just in general, not referring to local anesthetics at all, is that in the first trimester, we try to avoid any elective dental care. And the reason is, and this is not related to dentistry, but in the first trimester, the risk of spontaneous abortion and fetal malformation are higher. Once the, the, the lady, the, the female gets into the second, third, early third trimester, Dental care is okay. You know, you know, you're not going to be starting full mouth rehabilitation, but if, dental, if dentistry is required in the second or third trimesters, there's usually no problem. We'll talk about that in a second. And in the end of the third trimester, the lady on the upper, on the right-hand side, lying in the dental chair uh, in that, I won't say condition, but I did say condition, would be very uncomfortable for the mom. Local anesthetics, and sedative drugs will be found in the developing fetus. Now, keep in mind that there are no contraindications to using local anesthetics during pregnancy. But as I said a moment ago, non-urgent procedures are probably better put off until after the birth of the child. If a local anesthetic is needed, articaine. Articaine because of its shorter elimination half-life is the preferred drug in the pregnant patient. Epinephrine. Not a problem, but again, this repeated again and again and again, is that the smallest volume of the lowest concentration should be administered to that patient. Sedation, if necessary, is indicated, but I would strongly recommend that before you are going to be sedating this patient who's pregnant, do a, get, a, get a consultation with their physician or OBGYN before the sedation to discuss it. Inhalation sedation, I would say to you, is probably the only sedation technique you might want to use, very simply because you breathe it in at the end of the procedure when you turn off the nitrous and give the patient pure oxygen, it's gone. 
uh, oral medications are going to hang around for quite some time. And even though there might not be a problem, why subject the mom and the fetus, the developing baby, to the medication? Inhalation sedation is the preferred technique. Okay, she's given birth. She comes into the office and she is nursing her infant. Any drug, including local anesthetics and sedatives, will be found in the mother's milk. Now, there are no contraindications to the administration of local anesthetics, either with or without epinephrine to the nursing mother. However, however, is that once you mention to this nursing mother that I, I, I need to do, give you an injection of local anesthetic, articane, lidocaine, mepivacaine, uh, they say, will this drug be in the milk? And the answer is gonna be yes. And the first thing she's gonna say to you is I don't want it. I don't want to expose my baby, my, my, my little infant, to any drug that they don't need. Okay, so let's then discuss what local, well, let's go back to the same local anesthetic. Because of its shorter elimination, half-life, articane is the preferred local anesthetic in the nursing mother. Now, the United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, has what they call pump and discard. Okay, pump and discard. You, uh, you, you pump the milk and you discard it for nine hours for lidocaine, mepivacaine, and prilocaine. And that's because the half-life of these drugs is about 90 minutes. It takes about six half-lives, 540 minutes for the drug to be out of the milk. 540 minutes is nine hours. Articane, pump and discard for four hours because of its 27 minute half-life. However, and this is just from October of, of just last year, the American Society of Anesthesiologists this is a statement they made on resuming breastfeeding after anesthesia. This is October of last year. Patients should resume breastfeeding as soon as possible. Okay. It is not, very last line, it is not recommended for patients to pump and dump. So little conflicting evidence, but this is a statement from the people. Remember, anesthesiologists, that's what they do for a living. They administer anesthetic drugs. And the evidence has shown that the amount of local anesthetic and other anesthetics, but local anesthetics specifically, that is found in the mother's milk is minimal. Again, if, let me go back to this slide, if she is still concerned, articane, pump and dump for four hours would be the recommendation in that patient. Sedation, all the drugs will be in the milk. Inhalation sedation goes in, administer 100% oxygen at the end of the procedure, it comes out. Again, the preferred technique. Oral sedation, not as good because again, pump and discard, even though again, the, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has recommended you don't need to pump and discard, these drugs will hang around for quite a long time after they're administered. So inhalation sedation is preferred. So let's then move on to the last of these subjects, which is going to be the hot mandibular molar, uh, the actual technical name for this is symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. By the way, the pictures here, uh, I was giving a, a course in Columbia, Medellin, Columbia, to the endodontic society there. And this actually is a five foot sculpture of a molar tooth made with endodontic instruments. It was absolutely amazing. But, the symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, the hot mandibular molar. And this is absolutely the biggest challenge that we have in our profession uh, for pain control. Very, very difficult to achieve enough anesthesia to painlessly extirpate the patient's pulp. What you see here, that, that tooth you see is a sculpture. I was giving this a, a course on local anesthesia in Medellin, Colombia to their endodontic society. This is a five foot high sculpture of a mandibular molar made with endodontic instruments. It was simply phenomenal. So these are my recommendations when it comes to, to getting better, if you will, uh, but more effective pain control on these infected mandibular teeth. And there are four things listed here, articane, buffered local anesthesia, technique and sedation. So before I go on, I wanna go off on a detour with you, a slight detour, because on any number of occasions today, I have mentioned that articane is my preferred local anesthetic. Let me explain. 
Articane was synthesized in 1969 in Germany. It was introduced into the dental profession in 1976 in Germany. Articane was made for dentistry. This is the only local anesthetic ever. All the other local anesthetics, uh, lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, bupivacaine, are medical anesthetic drugs that we took and put them in cartridges. But this drug, Articane, is our drug. It is now starting to be used in the medical profession. In the United States, it's only been available since the year 2000. We're coming up in June of this year on the 20th anniversary. And it is today in, in, in the entire world in dentistry, the second most used local anesthetic with 600 million cartridges being used every year. Why do I like articaine? It's more lipid soluble compared to other local anesthetics. For a drug to diffuse through soft and hard tissue and into the nerve, it needs to be lipid soluble. All, locals, all local anesthetics are, but articaine is more lipid soluble. It makes it more effective. And as we'll discuss in just a moment, Infiltrating articaine in the buccal fold in the mandible, let's say by a mandibular first or second molar. In adult patients where the bone is normally too dense and infiltration doesn't work, articaine does. So it's more lipid soluble. And number two, and I've mentioned this briefly a little while ago when it came to the, uh, the pediatric and the geriatric patient, that articaine is metabolized as soon as it leaves the nerve, enters into capillaries and veins. Plasma esterases, enzymes found in the blood, will detoxify, metabolize articaine. The elimination half-life of other local anesthetics is about 90 minutes. Lidocaine, epivacaine, prilocaine, 90 minutes. The elimination half-life of articaine through studies in adults between 20 and 27 minutes, in a geriatric patient about 27 minutes, and in pediatric patients, anywhere from 18 to 23 minutes. And for that, those two reasons, primarily the second, I, this is my personal opinion, articaine is the preferred local anesthetic in the pregnant patient, in the nursing mother, in a pediatric patient, in a geriatric patient, and that's because of its shorter half-life. And as we'll discuss now, it's wonderful for mandibular infiltration in adult patients. And that again is because of its increase in lipid solubility. I've also praised, if you will, multiple times today, inhalation sedation with nitrous oxide oxygen. Why? Well, it relaxes the patient. It's a great sedative. It elevates the pain threshold. You know, if, if your mandibular block failed, it's not gonna make it work. But what if your mandibular block is almost perfect, but the patient's feeling a twinge now and then, it elevates the pain threshold and it will probably make that patient more comfortable. Also provides a degree of soft tissue analgesia and it provides oxygen and very simply, oxygen is good. Okay, so let's go back now to our, uh, our infected mandibular molar, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Number one on my list is articaine. Okay, now I would recommend giving articaine by mandibular block or Gau Gates mandibular block. You're going to see in parentheses uh, throughout the remaining slides the word buffered. I'll discuss buffering in just one moment. But articaine, inferior alveolar nerve block, or Gau Gates mandibular block. But now, this is what you want to do as soon as you finish giving the block. And, and this to me is really important. And if you're not doing it already, this is really going to help you when it comes to getting, in fact, I would recommend it's not just for the infected mandibular molar. I would recommend this as a routine, even for non-infected teeth in the mandible. As soon as you finish the inferior alveolar nerve block or the Gal Gates mandibular nerve block, infiltrate about a half of a cartridge of articaine in the buccal fold of the tooth you're treating. So if it's a mandibular first or second molar, infiltrate. And what it's going to do is this. This is a study published back in 2009, I think. I can't read that part of the slide. But it was published in the International Endodontic Journal, and John Meekin from the UK is the one who did this. It was a double-blinded, randomized, controlled clinical study. Patients came in, the bottom line, the blue line. They got an inferior alveolar nerve block, lidocaine with epinephrine, and they measured pulpal anesthesia uh, over 45 minutes using an electric pulp tester. And the success rate was 55.6%. 
patients came back another time. Remember, it was randomized controlled blinded study. So on the second occasion, they got the lidocaine, inferior alveolar nerve block, but they got a supplemental infiltration of articaine by the mandibular first molar. And you can see very, very obviously the pink red line on top, 91.7%. So you can take your 55% success rate on your IA block for mandibular first molars and you can make it 91.7%. And at the end of the study at 45 minutes, as you can see there, there's yet any indication of it going away. So this is a really, it doesn't matter what local anesthetic you're using for your block, whether you're using lidocaine, epivacaine, or prilocaine for your mandibular block or Gal-Gates block, even articaine, always supplement it after you finish the injection with an articaine buccal infiltration at the apex of the tooth you're treating, putting in about a half of a cartridge. Okay, uh, buffering. I, I mentioned buffering a number of times and what we're doing is this, uh, the, the, the pH of a local anesthetic cartridge, which contains epinephrine, is quite acidic, 3.5 more or less. And you, you see this when you give your, your injections with epinephrine-containing drugs. The patient feels a burning sensation. Another thing about uh, a low pH is that the onset time of pulpal anesthesia is slower. By raising the pH to 7.4, which is approximately the body's normal pH, and we're doing this through the addition of, um, of a drug called sodium bicarbonate, we are doing a number of very impressive things. Now, this is a paper that was published back in, in 2019. It actually was a cover story, story uh, on the Journal of the American Dental Association. And it, it basically says, do buffered local anesthetics, are they more successful than non-buffered anesthetics in patients with pulpally involved teeth requiring dental therapy? And the answer was, yeah, absolutely. Uh, buffering of local anesthetics has a 2.29 greater likelihood of achieving pulpal anesthesia. Other benefits of buffering, uh, much more rapid onset of anesthesia. As I just mentioned, it's more profound. Since you're injecting a drug that is at the same pH as the body, it is more comfortable, there's no burning sensation, and there is less post-injection soreness. Buffering systems are only available as I speak in the United States. Hopefully, uh, like any good product, any good, any good idea, it'll spread worldwide. But at this point in time, buffering is only available here in the United States. Okay, so let's go now to the third option. So number one option was articaine by mandibular block followed by an articaine buccal infiltration. Number two was buffering. Number three is other options. Other options include injections such as the periodontal ligament injection, which is also known as, in many cases, the intraligamentary injection. And then the second one on this list is intraosseous anesthesia. Uh, you can use uh, the devices here in the United States are called the, the Stabident and the X-Tip. These have been around, uh, intraosseous anesthesia has been around for a very long time and is used primarily in the endodontic profession. Sedation, number four. Okay, now sedation, again, it raises the pain threshold. So even if you're on this infected tooth, if your block is not perfect, it does raise the pain threshold and it takes what might be a sharp, ow, uncomfortable pain, it makes it into a dull, aching, I don't care kind of a pain. It won't make your block work if it failed, but it will help. It relaxes a patient. Most of these patients with infected mandibular molars, the reason their teeth are infected in the first place is that they're dental phobics. That's why they waited so long to get their teeth taken care of. It relaxes the patient and it also provides a degree of soft tissue analgesia. So the, again, these were my four recommendations uh, for the symptomatic irreversible pulpitis in a mandibular molar. Um, logically, since buffering is not available everywhere, you have articaine. You have articaine by mandibular block, followed by an articaine buccal infiltration at the apex of the tooth you're treating. You have a variety of techniques. We have the traditional inferior alveolar nerve block. We have the gout gates. You can do articaine buccal infiltration. You can do the PDL. And we have intraosseous anesthesia. And don't forget sedation. The reason many of these patients are there in the first place in excruciating pain 
they had been in pain for four months, five months, and they kept on putting it off because they were afraid of the dentist. Sedation is going to help. So we discussed these. We discussed the cardiovascular risk patient. We discussed geriatrics, pediatrics, the pregnant patient, the nursing mother, and the hot mandibular molar. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me in this webinar. I apologize for the technical glitch, but nothing is perfect. And I trust that this has been of some benefit to you. So thank you very much for participating. My email address one more time. Uh, I guess we're going to have maybe some time for questions and answers right now. But if you want to contact me directly, there's my email address, malamid at usc.edu. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. Uh, a lot of them uh, disappeared when, uh, unfortunately, the Goat Webinar tool got disconnected. Um, Stanley, maybe okay. if I can read them to you, because they are actually quite sure. uh, hard to read. <laughs> so okay. we had a couple of questions regarding uh, children below four years old. And um, yes. to uh, how to manage manage them, uh, which which type of molecule, and how to how to deal with them, for instance. Okay, so uh, that question about four years of age and and above for articane. I'm, I'm going to use specifically articane. Uh, the reason the package insert in the United States and many other countries says that articane is recommended for patients who are four years of age and above has to do with the studies that we did here in the United States back in the late 1990s to get Articane approved. We enrolled in our studies patients who were four years of age and above. So we showed the United States FDA, and it was also done in the United Kingdom, that Articane is safe and effective from four years of age and above. So the question that comes up is, is it, now again, I'm speaking from the American perspective, is it legal, is it okay for you to use Articane on a child who is three years of age and two years of age? The answer is yes. Again, keep in mind, the United States, okay? The answer is yes. Also Canada, by the way. Um, there have been a number of papers published and if, any, if, if the doctor who asked that question wants to get, uh, I can send you that paper, okay? But Articane is being used in patients who are under the age of four very, very successfully and safely safely because of the half-life. The half-life of the drug is only 27 minutes. So yes, uh, in the United States, that is called an off-label use of the medication. Our Food and Drug Administration says it is perfectly legal to do so. Um, I forgot the name of the drug, but now with the COVID epidemic, um, my president has been touting Hydro, one of those hydrochlorazone or something, one of the, I forget the medication, but using that medication that is used for rheumatoid arthritis, that's the approved indication for it. They're now starting to use this in an, in an off-label use to help manage COVID-19. So the answer for this is Articane, yes, can be used safely in patients who are under the age of four. Right. Thank you very much. Um, another question is, uh, what is actually your recommendation? Um, so you said that for uh, with the pregnant woman, uh, we should delay um, the treatment. And the question here is, are we supposed to delay every type of treatment or is it only treatments involving local anesthesia? And this dentist uh, specifies that um, he's always been taught that dental hygiene procedures uh, would be safe uh, for during the second trimester, but he would like your okay. professional opinion. Sure. Okay, well, very remember, we, we were talking primarily about local anesthetics and sedation here today. And uh, uh, that's good. In first trimester, I understand, everybody understands that we try to avoid. Second trimester, as long as the pregnancy is going along well, and that's why a consultation with the, with the patient's physician or OBGYN is indicated. Um, locals are indicated, yes. And if you're going to be doing uh, scaling and root planing without local anesthesia, there's no problem. There's, there's no problem whatsoever. 
again, we, we were talking about specifically anesthetic drugs with epinephrine and sedation. And they are also okay in that second trimester. But what I also did mention is you don't want to start doing extensive dental procedures. I mean, scaling and root planing is not extensive. There, I, there's no problem with that. But you don't want to do a full mouth reconstruction in that situation. But what you're talking about without local anesthetics, as long as the pregnancy is going along well, there's no problem at all. All right, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, during endodontic treatments for upper maxillary premolar or molar, molar is palatal um, local anesthesia uh, indicated? Okay, so if you're going to be doing pulpal extirpation on a maxillary molar, first thing I would recommend is doing the posterior superior alveolar nerve block, okay, or an articane buccal infiltration. Now, one of the advantages of articane is that it diffuses better than other local anesthetics. And there have been numerous case reports. Now, this is not science, this is all anecdotal of giving an articane buccal infiltration and getting palatal soft tissue anesthesia. So as a rule, you know, going now to the question directly, the PSA nerve will innervate all three roots of that maxillary molar. But in 27% of the patients, the mesial buccal root of that first molar may not be anesthetized. Okay, a palatal injection is not going to do it. What you would need to do in that situation for maxillary first molar is an articane or any local anesthetic buccal infiltration, and then doing another buccal infiltration over the second premolar. That would get the middle superior alveolar nerve, which is the one that in 27% of the patients provides pulpal anesthesia to the maxillary first molar's mesial buccal root. That was a very long-winded question. But, I, but to answer the question more specifically, uh, there's no real reason to do a palatal infiltration if you're treating uh, endodontically a maxillary first or second molar. Right, thanks. Um, we also have a question again regarding uh, children. There are actually a lot of questions regarding children, uh, articane with children uh, below four mm -hmm. years old, and, uh, and also that one, uh, articane with children, which one is the most effective uh, between infiltration or nerve blocks? Okay, uh, depends on the age of the child. And this is true for any local anesthetic, but we'll talk about articane specifically. If the child only has primary teeth, no permanent teeth yet, then infil buccal in mandibular infiltration will work. Whether it's lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, or articaine, it'll work. In a very young child, the cortical plate of bone in the mandible is not very thick. Infiltration works. Now, once they get into a mixed dentition, the, the first molar comes in, for example, the child is older, the bone is thicker, and there's no longer a guarantee that infiltration is going to work. So that's the basic rule. In other words, we say that infiltration, if it's only primary teeth in the mandible, infiltration with any drug is okay. Once they get to a mixed dentition, then you go to nerve block. Okay, and again, if you keep on going down the road, once all the permanent teeth are in, and this goes back to the adult mandible, uh, the bone is usually too thick. And that's why we have to do that darned inferior alveolar nerve block. Now, let's go back one minute. In the mixed dentition, when that child is, First, getting permanent teeth, articane. Articane buccal infiltration will have a greater success rate than the other local anesthetics. By the way, I, I, I praise articane. You know, when I was teaching for 40 years at USC and uh, local anesthesia, and I, my, my students would ask me, Dr. Malamed, what is your favorite local anesthetic? I would say, they're all good. They're all good. Now that, you know, I don't want to bias my students. But quite honestly, and you've heard me say this multiple times so far today, that articane is better. Articane is a more effective local anesthetic than the other ones because it's more lipid soluble. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have a question here. 
um, from a, a dentist who, well, of course, understood that articaine was a very good used with infiltration and who therefore asked if it was possible to use li um, lidocaine for nerve block and addition, uh, an addition of articaine with, uh, I mean, for vocal infiltration. Yeah. Well, what I said at the end of the program was that, you know, going back to that hot mandibular molar discussion, is that you can use any local anesthetic for your block injection. You can use your lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine for your nerve block. But specifically, I, say, I, I said, you want to always infiltrate articaine in the buccal fold, putting in a half a cartridge after you give the block. So you can use any, any local you want for the block. It doesn't really matter. But the articaine buccal infiltration, the study I showed where it went from 55% uh, success with lidocaine with epinephrine, to 91% success, lidocaine with epinephrine followed by an articaine buccal infiltration. Yeah, so use whatever local anesthetic you want for your block, but always use the articaine buccal infiltration after the block has been given. Right. Question regarding uh, safety and comorbidities. Which local anesthesia is ideally used for a patient who has a liver problem and kidney problem? Okay, well, again, we, we discussed this. Um, all the locals except articaine undergo metabolism primarily in the liver. So if somebody has significant liver disease, okay, articaine, 95% is metabolized in the blood. So the liver has no effect whatsoever on the metabolism of articaine. So when it comes to patients with severe hepatic problems, liver disease, if you need to use a local anesthetic, articaine. Uh, kidney, same thing. Even though the vast majority of the local anesthetic is metabolized in the liver, for each of the anesthetic drugs, a small percentage is excreted in the urine unchanged. So somebody who's on renal dialysis, somebody you know who's uh, functionally anephric, their kidneys don't work, we go back to articaine. Yes, articaine, you know, articaine is a good drug. It's different, it works better, and it, it's chemically, it looks like a local, uh, most local anesthetics, but it, it is different. And in patients with liver disease, patients with severe kidney disease, articaine is preferred. Right, question regarding armamentarium. Um, could you please throw light on painless local anesthesia delivery devices? Painless local anesthesia devices. Okay, very, very simply. Look, uh, in a study published in the year 2006 by Jennifer D. St. George, she is a practice management consultant. How a patient evaluates their dentist. Number two on the list was a dentist who doesn't hurt. Number one was the ability to give a painless injection. How do you give a painless injection? Uh, topical. Topical works, leave it on for at least a minute. Stretch the tissue so the needle cuts through sharply and inject slowly. And that third one is probably the most important. Slow injections are more comfortable. Everybody knows that. Um, why I mentioned the computerized devices? Because they make you inject slowly. In fact, most of these devices have two speeds, slow and slower. And the ability, there have been a number of studies published by a uh, Israeli pediatric dentist, Malka Ashkenazi, using the wand, one of the first computerized devices in children, giving palatal injections. And on a scale of from zero to 10, it's called the visual analog scale. Um, if you felt nothing, it was a zero. It was the worst pain imaginable. It was a 10. Using computerized devices, the numbers are always low zero, one, or I, I can't guarantee a zero on a palatal injection, but a one or a two. Very, very comfortable. So really slow injection, use of topical, and the computerized devices, the, the wand and the, um, the, dent, the dent eject are, are the things you want to look at. Dentapen are the things you want to look at. Right. 
That was very clear. Thanks, Stanley. Um, we have a question regarding um, pre medication. Is it useful to, uh, to, in order to increase the success of a hot mandibular molar treatment, to use uh, NSAIDs before? non-sterile anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay. Uh, keep in mind now that I'm not an endodontist, so I only deal with this in a, a peripheral way, but NSAIDs are great. Uh, they're, they're great for pre -op When it comes to, let's change it, post-operative pain control, the NSAIDs are fantastic medications. When it comes to pre-operative on a patient who has a hot tooth, it's going to help. Now, if there's infection present on that tooth, antibiotics will also help. If you can get rid of the infection, break the pain cycle with the NSAIDs, ibuprofen, for example, is one example, is probably the most used of medications, then that'll help us to achieve better pain control when we want to go in and extirpate that patient's pulp. So the answer is yes. The NSAIDs are, they're, they're, they are the best drugs we have right now when it comes to oral medications uh, for pain control. Right, thanks. Um, I have actually three or four questions um, about the, the buffering and for, from doctors who were asking if it was possible to inject sodium bicarbonate in the same loca location as the local anesthetic. And would that be an option um, to, to, to buffer? Okay, the answer to that is no. Okay, because remember the body's pH is 7.4. So if you're injecting a drug into the patient's mouth at 7.4 and then injecting a local, it's not going to do anything. But whoever those doctors are, I don't want to go into this uh, on, the, on the webinar, whoever those doctors are, email me and I can give you some specific information about how to do this. Because the medical profession has been buffering local anesthetics forever because injecting local anesthetics into skin is much more uncomfortable than injecting local anesthetics into the patient's mouth. And there are numerous articles that we've looked at uh, on buffering from the medical profession, but I would not recommend injecting bicarbonate into the patient's mouth first and then giving the local. But there are other ways to do this. So contact me, my email address again is, let me go back to this slide, malamid at usc.edu and I'll send them some information. Thanks, another question regarding the, the, the C-CLADS. Um, so we have a dentist who is um, who just bought an intraosseous device and he finds that there is a, a steep learning curve. Um, what is your opinion on the potential of intraosseous devices? Well, you said it's CQLAB, but intraosseous is different. Intraosseous, I, I mentioned specifically two brand names available here in the United States. One is the XDIP and the other one is the um, Stabadent. And yes, there's a learning curve, but you know these devices come with um, descriptions, how to use it. And essentially what you're doing is you're drilling a hole in the cortical plate of bone in the mandible, just distal to the tooth you're treating. So if you're in the uh, United States, it would be tooth number 30, Outside US, it might be number four, six, but it's the mandibular right for a smolar. And you, you make this perforation in the bone, distal to the tooth you're treating. You then put your needle, local anesthetic syringe needle, into that hole and you inject the local anesthetic. And that's how simple the procedure is. Uh, what I said, it sounds simple, but drilling the hole is easy, it is painless. Finding the hole with that needle is difficult. That's the learning curve right there, because you've made a hole in bone about it's about the diameter of a 27 gauge needle. It's very small. It is covered by soft tissue. So once you take out the, 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 the drill when you made the hole and you put your needle back in, you've got to find that hole. And that has been the problem that many doctors have. That's the, I think that's the learning curve this doctor is talking about. The X tip device, you drill the hole when you pull out the burr, it leaves a metal rod and a plastic hub in the soft tissue. So that takes away the problem of finding the hole. But intraosseous, again, there's always a learning curve for any technique. I mean, the gal gates technique, anything you're doing for the first time, there is a learning curve. And that is the same, it is true with intraosseous injections. 
Right. Um, a couple of questions uh, about what is your opinion on topic of on using topical anesthetics? Oh God, I love topicals. I, got, I, I unfortunately I've gone through some dental treatment. Other than scaling and root planning, I've gone through some real dental treatment uh, of late, and topicals work. Uh, you need you have first of all you have to believe they work, because there are dentists who just do it. Uh, you know what? The patient expects me to do this. They put a little bit on and they wipe it off immediately. You've got to leave the topical on that soft tissue for at least a minute. Now, what that's going to do is allow you to penetrate the mucous membrane painlessly. It anesthetizes the outermost two to three millimeters of soft tissue, but you can get in painlessly. And for most injections, other than the palate, once you're in, the rest of the injection is going to be painless. Okay, but topicals work, yes. Uh, as to, uh, with personal experience now, the flavoring thing is debatable. You know, when I had some work done recently, my, my dentist said to me, do you want chocolate or, or, or strawberry? And I said, give me the strawberry. It didn't taste like strawberry. It was, eh, you know, it, it, local anesthetics don't taste good. And that's one of the problems we have. Nobody ever said to, said to you, doc, I loved it. That stuff you squirted in my mouth really tastes good. Even injectable drugs. They're bitter, but topicals work. If you leave them on the soft, take a two by two, dry the tissue, then take a cotton swab, an applicator stick, put a little bit of topical on and leave it in the buckle fold. Leave it there for at least a minute. Take it out. You can put that needle in there without that patient feeling it. Right. Uh, another question regarding armamentarium. So what would be your recommendation regarding the size of the needle? Uh, this dentist said that uh, he or she prefers to use a, a 31 gauge for pediatric and even for adult patient. Do you have a, a preferred size of yes. the needle? Very, very strong feelings about that. Uh, if I go back to the first edition of my book, this is back in 1978, it was a 25 long and a 27 short, okay? And sadly, uh, statistics from the United States, what needles dentists purchased, this is, goes back to about 2017, 1% of the needles sold in the United States in the dental profession, 1% are 25 gauge needles. Over 55% are 30 gauge needles. Okay, 27 gauge is the second most commonly used. Now. I have a problem using a 30 gauge needle on an adult patient giving an inferior ovular nerve block. I get involved, even though dental needles are fantastic, um, the quality of care is fantastic, on rare occasion, a needle will break. Now it's not due to faulty manufacturing, it has to do with what the dentist does to the needle. Very often a dentist for some reason will bend a needle Sometimes a needle will accidentally uh, contact bone and a 25 gauge needle won't break. A 27 gauge needle won't break. When I get involved in cases of broken needles and I've been involved with over 150 of them in my career, it's always a 30 gauge needle. It's always a 30 gauge needle, short, not a long, short, giving an inferior alveolar nerve block on an adult patient. And one of the first things that I think everybody who's watching this seminar right now was taught in dental school is that you don't want to insert a needle all the way into the soft tissue to its hub. And if you're using a short dental needle on an adult patient, you are going down to the hub every time. Now, one of the things I talk about in my, pro in my programs is that you can do whatever you want in your dental practice. Whether it's right or wrong, you can do it until a problem happens. And if a problem happens, you have to defend what you did. And I would say to you that it is almost impossible for you to defend the fact that you're using a short, a 30 gauge short needle to give an inferior alveolar nerve block in an adult patient. Okay, that's, I mean, that's the long and, long and short of it right there. I, I, I am not a fan of 30 gauge needles. All right, we have a couple of questions um, regarding allergies. Uh, to a, any type of um, local anesthesia. So do you recommend, uh, I mean, 
I think I know what you're going to say. Do you recommend a special mole molecule regarding allergies? Um, and is okay. there any type of um, allergies to epinephrine as well? We have a lot of questions about okay. this. Question. Very simple question, and, and I'm not exactly where in the world that doctor is, but when I travel to certain parts of Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe is where that question comes up all the time. And let me just make this statement as an, I'm going to make it as an absolute statement. The, the amide local anesthetics, these are the articane, lidocaine, mecritocaine, prolocaine, bupivacaine, the five I mentioned earlier, have been around since 1948. And I would venture to get, and keep in mind that we're injecting almost 2 billion cartridges of local anesthetic a year worldwide. The number of cases of true documented and reproducible allergy to local anesthetics is essentially zero. Okay, that's it. Okay, it doesn't, these are very, very safe molecules. Is one safer than the other? No. Amide locals, the five that we are talking about here today are very, very safe. Now, can allergy happen? Yes. Has it happened? I don't think so. You know, if you look at the literature uh, uh, on cases of, of, in quotes, alleged allergic reactions, uh, they've been proven to be something other than allergy. Okay, so let's then talk about epinephrine. It is absolutely impossible for a person to be alive and be allergic to epinephrine. And the very simple reason is epinephrine is in your body. If you had an allergy to epinephrine, you would have died in utero. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. You know, the, here's the, the, let's go back to local and epinephrine, okay? When a patient comes into your, into your surgery, into your practice, and says, I'm allergic to, I'm allergic to Novocaine, which we don't use, but that's the word they use. Uh, I'm allergic to local anesthetic, I'm allergic to epinephrine. The two questions you want to ask the patient, describe your allergy. Tell me what happened. And if you hear itching, hives, rash, difficulty breathing, you believe them, but you don't hear that. You hear, I fainted, sweating, shaking. My heart began to beat rapidly, palpitations. That is not a, a, a local anesthetic allergy. It's not a nephrine allergy. That's the first question. Describe what happened. Number two is how was your allergy treated? In most cases, they said, nothing. It went away. Allergy doesn't just go away. The doctor gave me oxygen. Oxygen is a very fantastic drug, but it's not a specific drug for treating allergy. The doctor used smelling salts. Uh, okay, that's great for fainting, but it's not used for allergy. If the patient says to you, epinephrine, adrenaline, epinephrine, or they gave me a, a, a diphenhydramine, an antihistamine, then you believe them. But the point is you don't hear that. So those are the two questions. Describe your allergy and how was it treated? And you can determine, basically you're gonna be determining that it wasn't an allergic reaction. Most of the adverse reactions to local anesthetics and epinephrine are psychogenic. They're fear-induced emergencies. Right. So uh, a couple of uh, last questions. I mean, we, we have billions of questions, but we will have to, to have a hop at half past, uh, half past six. But uh, during those last minutes, let's have um, a, few, a few additional questions, if it's fine with you, uh, Stanley. Um, yeah, keep going. Cool. We, we, we actually have uh, lots of questions. Um, and I think maybe you need to, to make another statement here again. <laughs> Uh, is there a link between paresthesia and, uh, and articane? I don't think you can see me, but I'm smiling right now. Uh, <laughs> that question has been definitively answered. And the answer is no. There is no, no, there's no, no correlation whatsoever. Now, to defend that, I have two articles that I've published. Uh, again, I'd like the doctors to email me. But um, I have been involved in this controversy, if you will, ever since Articane was introduced in the United States back in the year 2000. And there has been, for all of the reported, the proof, if you will, has been anecdotal evidence, case reports. And when it comes to scientific validity, 
a case report is the least scientific of all possible forms of science. On the top of the list is what is called a meta-analysis. And there have been any, uh, again, I can send these articles out to people, but there have been any number of meta-analyses done proving that articaine is no more neurotoxic than other local anesthetics. In fact, there's been more recent research done in the last three or four years, published research, that articaine is less neurotoxic than some of the other local anesthetics that we're using. Again, if anybody wants these articles, they can email me, or if you want, Elsa, I can send them to you and you can distribute them. But the controversy is unfounded. It, it, it exi it's still out there, it lingers, but keep in mind that articaine, it's the second most used local in the world in dentistry. If there was, if there were a significant problem with articaine by block, we would know it and people would stop using it. That is not the case. That is not the case. So the answer is no. There is no evidence whatsoever that articaine has a higher risk of paresthesia. Thank you very much. Um, maybe one of the last questions. We had a couple of questions regarding um, Oraverse, so uh, the reversal agent. Um, so first, could, could it be used uh, to, to reverse an, um, anesthesia after nerve blocks first? And then where should it be uh, injected exactly? Is it not next to uh, the, the injection spot uh, or elsewhere? Okay, so very, very simply, uh, you know, we add epinephrine to local anesthetics to keep them in the nerve longer by decreasing the blood flow to the area, more local anesthetic enters into the nerve and it stays there longer. So we get profound pulpal anesthesia lasting for one hour, but we're also increasing the duration of soft tissue to about three to five hours. And we don't need that. You know, one of the reasons I said to you, I like nitrous oxide oxygen sedation is because when you're done, you put them on oxygen and it's gone. And it would be wonderful if we had a drug we could administer to a patient after local, make it go away. We don't have that drug. But Oraverse fentolamine mesylate, which is the actual drug, is a vasodilator. So what you do, it comes in a dental cartridge, and at the end of the procedure, not when you're totally done, but when you finish cutting on that tooth, before you start putting in the restoration, you inject the Oraverse, the fentolamine, into the same place you put the local anesthetic earlier. And by, it's a vasodilator. So it counteracts the effects of the epinephrine and the local anesthetic will then leave the nerve more rapidly. And you saw the numbers, uh, how, how rapidly the lower lip came back uh, with no anesthesia after the reversal agent. So you have to inject the drug into the site where you put the injection earlier. And we now know that you, all you need to do is one cartridge. So you do one cartridge, into the same place you put the anesthetic drug earlier. It's used primarily, it can be used anywhere in the mouth, but really the biggest problem that most patients have is there is the tongue is numb and the lip is numb. So it's used primarily in the mandible. Right, and maybe a last, um, last question. Um, so you, you already give the, gave us a lot of advice uh, regarding this, but uh, we have question about how to make uh, an anesthesia painless and uh, for instance, how to make palatal anesthesia painless. So what would be your, okay. your advice to finish with the, the webinar? I'm gonna make that really easy. How to make palatal injections painless, use a computerized device, very, very simply. There have been any number of well-designed clinical studies, one by Dr. Mark Hoffman, who actually is the person who developed the, the original device called the wand, where they had 50 dentists who injected each other on the palate with a traditional syringe versus the computerized device. And in, on that visual analog scale, zero to 10, the numbers with the traditional syringe were in the sevens, eights, and nines, they were painful the numbers with the computerized device who are in the ones and twos and threes. That's the simple answer right there. The computerized devices make any injection more comfortable, especially on the palate. Right, so thank you very much, Professor Manamed. That was very interesting. Uh, that was more than 3,000 
people trying to, to connect tonight. So this is also why we got these uh, technical issues. Um, yeah. oh, regarding the number of questions and the number of uh, participants who, who registered, I think uh, this uh, webinar was quite, uh, quite a success and thank you so much. Um, just to say to, to all of you that this was recorded. So you will find on the uh, Septodon Facebook page uh, starting tomorrow the, the video of, uh, of the webinar. Thank you so much, Stanley. If you want to maybe add the, the very last word before we <laughs> close the webinar. Well, very last words. I hope, number one, that it was of some value to you. Number one, number two is stay healthy. And as I said at the beginning, I hope someday in the future we'll be able to get together and do this live and in person. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you so much.